All right, Joshua, it's music time. And then we got a couple of clips. But first, it's time for the music history. Let's go. All right. So today, uh, I want to talk about a band called The Specials from the UK. This is, I'm holding up a, a seven inch single of the song Ghost Town. And it struck me actually, Michael, it, when you were interviewing Dr. Cornell West today, um, there's two things you both said, both uh, that, that are in a little bit of tension that I loved. One is that you said early on in the interview, you were just talking about our landscape and you said, uh, it looks bleak and it feels bleak. And, and Dr. West said, it is bleak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is bleak. <laughs> and then, I, love, I love that realism. Yeah. And then later uh, he said, musicians are the vanguard of the species. And um, the first part I think relates to this song, Ghost Town. And the second part I think uh, relates to the role that the specials played uh, in 1970s and 80s UK. Um, and the, you know, like the founder of Rock Against Racism called it crisis music. And uh, it feels eerily relevant to the town, uh, the, the, the mood right now, not just because a lot of downtowns feel like ghost towns, um, mm. But let me, let me contextualize the genre of music first, uh, and then we'll talk about the record. So um, we're talking about the lineage of ska music. And um, in you know, post-World War II, uh, Britain was destroyed, and there was a huge influx of Jamaican migrants uh, to come and rebuild uh, England uh, as laborers. And uh, short, you know, the... the next generation, first generation immigrants of, of, um, of Jamaicans were growing up uh, in urban centers all around the UK and in working class cities like Coventry uh, were growing up next to white kids uh, in mass in a way that was a different working class uh, kind of racial demographic that the UK, than the UK had ever seen. And at the time, uh, like uh, the wave of working class white music was, was like the early kind of punk rock stuff. And there was um, these like kind of awkward attempts to fuse punk and reggae music, which never worked out very well, except for the clash did it well. But, um, but uh, in Coventry, there was a group of folks who said, why don't we fuse like the energy and attitude of punk with the um, ancestor of reggae, uh, which is ska music. So ska music emerged in Jamaica in the late 1950s and uh, through the late 1960s. And this was the music that like a lot of these kids growing up, it was what their parents listened to. And it's like reggae, but it's faster uh, and it's more guitar driven um, and it's more politicized and it's less spiritual. So rather than like orienting around the figure of like a Rastafarian, it was organized the figure around the figure of a rude boy, which is like a gangster. And so it was, um, you know, kind of valorized sort of this gangster image. So I'm talking about, you know, first wave acts like, you know, like Prince Buster or Derek Morgan or Laurel Aiken. Actually, I'll, I'll, this is Desmond Decker, who was a mentor to Bob Marley. Um, you can kind of see his like 1950s rude boy style. Uh, he's my favorite artist in the world. We'll, I'm sure, talk about him more another time. Uh, or like early Toots and the Maytals, Don Drummond. So th th this is some of the lineage, right? Two-tone music in 1977 is born with this band called The Specials. And it's, uh, they, they launch not just, you know, um, a sound, but they are self-consciously trying to build a musical subcultural movement. And it is in explicitly rooted in uh, working class politics. And it has a musical mission of organizing working class youth uh, to turn um, over to a politic of primarily anti-racism. And so the larger kind of milieu was that um, a lot of uh, like, you know, kind of the, the equivalent of rude boys in England at the time were, were skinheads, which were not... Um, politicized necessarily in either direction. Uh, right. And the National Front, who were Nazis, were actually actively recruiting skinheads into their ranks. And so this was sort of a counter recruitment effort. So their whole aesthetic and style is like, you know, black and white checkers. And they are, you know, like, like the, mus the, the headlines at the time, they're the first band that reaches the top of the pops that is a multiracial band that's never happened in British history. And it's like blows people's minds. Yeah, were you? 
No, I'm listening. Oh, cool. I, um, so like, like uh, they're like, it, this isn't a concert with black bands and white bands on the same bill. This is a band with black and white members in the same group together. Like it was like, oh. right, 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 right. <laughs> And it spawns right. um, this whole orientation to like, like basically the, the principles of the movement were like number one, knowing your roots, so that they were really paying homage to the to the lineage of black music and applying it towards working class conditions in the UK. So there was like, you know, they had like Rico Rodriguez, who was the trombonist of the band The Scatolites, who was like one of the you know inventors of reggae music join their band they were constantly reinventing these old songs and their their first they got huge their first seven singles all went top 10 and uh it also so you know the the paying the reason why i mentioned the like knowing your root stuff is they were insisting on music being high context uh mm -hmm. and uh being contextualized both in sort of a cultural but also a political and economic milieu that was at its root fundamentally defined by working class politics above all else in a way that I wanted to share on this show because I think that what you're teasing out in your interviews with both Adolf Reed and Dr. Cornell West that speaks to one of the discord questions earlier is um, a, a materialist anti-racism. Um, and that I think is what is embodied by, by a band like this. And so um, I'll just talk about the record briefly. Uh, could we do, um, I, I have a sound clip of, of an interview about the record that will just set it up. You got it, David? Yeah, it's coming. Sweet. Now the unofficial anthem of civil strife, Ghost Town was number one in the charts as Prince Charles wed Lady Diana. While official Britain put out the flags, the counterculture had voted with its music. We really need to focus on the place of Ghost Town as a very important kind of cultural event in not only providing a, a sort of coincidence that helps to explain that uh, incredible wave of rioting, but also in offering a kind of explanation for it afterwards and in in, in, in tapping into all those historic forces that produced it in the first place. It's a really incredible coincidence. It's an incredible um, encounter that brings all those different dynamics together in that way. The specials will always be remembered for me as putting politics and music and a youth voice on the agenda, you know, in Britain at that time. And I think Ghost Town was the seminal song for that period. To me, they seem to be about inner city energy and anger and they were the sound they were the soundtrack to the riots but they were also the soundtrack that made you think there might be some optimism we were different for sure yeah so this song comes out uh 1981 and it's on the heels of 1980 to 81 is called the summer of riots so we're talking both like the saint paul's riot in bristol uh, as well as when we were talking about Jimmy Cliff before, we were talking about the Brixton riots. This was the, not sort of the antecedent to it, like the Clash song was, or some of the like Linton Quessy Johnson songs that were written about it afterwards. This was what people were playing during it. <laughs> and it was, um, so it, it, it was this moment of upheaval and it became, it was at the top of the pop charts for three weeks straight. And it was, you know, like, part, first of all, just describe the song as like, it's like haunting and it's watery and yep. it's sort of ethereal. And I think it captures this moment uh, that we're in really well. It captures a lot of kind of my emotional state when I look out at the world. And it also feels relevant to share right now because it came out in a context where Thatcher had been in power for a year and it was the first wave of the consequences of all of the anti-austerity measures that Thatcher had put in place. And so there was 1 million people that uh, were on, that got put on unemployment, lost their jobs that year. And I think it was something like that. So the total rolls were two and a half million people uh, in Britain were unemployed that year, which was the highest that had, it had been in the history of that country. And so there's all of these angry uh, poor and working class youth who are getting mobilized politically. And this, the, the, the last piece that I want to share that I'm curious to get your take on, uh, Michael, is 
one of the other reason I wanted to share it is to talk about the role of subculture and the relationship between subculture and mass movements. Yeah. And I'll also just say that like, this is the band that politicized me. Like I, I was in a ska band when I was a teenager. I interviewed the specials in the mid nineties. Wow. Um, I saw them lot, like I, like they were a part of my um, development, you know, and yeah. both in, in, and, um, you know, like I, I had a zine in, in like the mid nineties and would like ask them about racism and they would like school me and tell me stories about it just as some like fresh faced young kid that was like able to sneak backstage at a show, you know? And like, um, uh, we talk a lot on this show um, about the ways that when the left gets stuck in subcultural modes that prioritize style over substance, um, and get away from orienting to a mass movement that is like the death of the left. And to me, the distinction is that like a subculture is about signaling your alienation with society, whereas a movement is actually trying to proactively change it. And if you want to change society, you need to recognize yourself as a part of it, not just define yourself in opposition to it. Right. And so the trap that the left gets in that, that we deconstruct all the time is the, is like when you get stuck into a subcultural stance that prevents you uh, from orienting in, in a mass way. And certainly when the, the style of the politics gets you away from a materialist frame, uh, it, it, it gets whatever. We, we talk about it all the time. On the other hand, though, Sub, youth subcultures in particular and musical subcultures in general are social blocks that mass movements can organize and mobilize on their behalf. And there are lots of people who get politicized through them and the special, what the specials created through the two-tone ska movement is one of them where people go on and like, you know, Jerry Corbin has cited the specials as something that like yeah. oriented his politics at, at, at a certain moment. And so it's a conduit if it's done well into mass politics, if you have mass-based organizations who are then looking at, and, 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 as, at subcultures as a base from which to organize. The other thing that's worth pointing out is during this period in Britain, the National Front uh, was very active, which was their neo-Nazi movement. They're making electoral gains and they had their sort of like frontline street protesters were also, they were uh, organizing from within youth subcultures. And so, Two Tone was was a subcultural. Uh, uh, I'm, I want to. I don't want to say the word movement because it's not really what I mean. But it, it was uh, a subculture that was able to siphon people off who were working class people who were looking for some expression of their pain who could have easily broken fascist. And instead they broke anti-fascist uh, because there was a subculture that gave them meaning, which. Uh, remove the National Front, which like could have actually had a lot more um, street muscle that it could have mobilized yeah. had this not happened. Uh, and so yeah. I think that's the dialectic with the role of subculture that is part of what I want to explore through this series when we think about music uh, and, its, and its relationship to movements. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I just have a couple of quick thoughts and I know that we'll keep exploring them more, but I think it's I, what... It, the first part that kind of comes to me, and this is weird, this reminds me of like when I was first out of college and I was doing some like super basic trend watching work, nothing all that glamorous, but I was involved in that world a little bit. And a lot of that world is, you know, it's bullshit. I mean, it really is just trying to kind of snoop on culture and, you know, turn it into ad campaigns or whatever. Although it's, I have a lot of compassion in some ways for that field because it's sort of like the only area where, you know, you want to be creative, but like have dental insurance. So you, you look at, you know, branding or whatever. Um, but one thing that I learned, I think I have a sense of from that, which is really interesting, which is like this moment you're describing is so specific and so powerful and so resonant, and it really can't be replicated. So I think another thing that also happens too, is that people, we, we have these extraordinary examples from a variety of different contexts and they're powerful and they're real and they're significant, like, you know, the human antennas of culture. Uh, but we, we get fixated and then we, I think sometimes like kind of try to recreate them. I mean, like the most extreme version of that is like, you know, Oh my God, like the whole horrible protest with like the same folk songs being played again or whatever. And, 
it isn't like, I mean, those folk songs are actually beautiful historically. Like we, we talked about that last week, but you can't replicate them or force them in a new context. So I think one of the paradoxes about learning from those things is the extent to which there really was something new going on and mm -hmm. you have to like try to orient yourself to your present context because who knows how those things are going to emerge now. And I also think, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I do think that, you know, capitalism in some ways is so much more burrowed into cultural production. It makes it a little right. difficult. Right. Yeah. On the other hand, um, I think that, uh, and then, no, I think, I think that it's actually a big advantage to, you know, yeah. Like if, if you're part of a subculture that is dynamic and cool and awesome, <laughs> that's dynamic and cool and awesome versus, you know, cultish off-putting and unpleasant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And then, but then, then the think the third thing that I do want that I think is, is, is important is I do think that we did learn in a variety of different ways that capitalism and even now with like transgression and then the like kill all normies books, she broke this down. Like that, some things that used to be considered to be very clear kind of cultural signifiers of the left can either be in the mass sense. Like I, I listened to this fun, I forget where, but it was like a fun defense of hippies. And they were like, you know, hippies get so much shit, but like the punks actually sold out a lot more. Like there's more <laughs> yeah, punk yeah. bands that like license their ads for their songs for car commercials than, you know, nice hippies who are trying to like end the war or whatever, you know, as much as we give them a hard time. So I think uh, it, it still is important. And, and you're even talking about it there in the battle of like, what would sort of define these subcultures? Like, would mm -hmm. it be national front or would it be this materialist anti-racist thing? That's a contested terrain. There isn't mm -hmm. anything necessarily innate in that. Right. And I think that's also some humility in that because I think the truth is, is like the, you know, other capitalism itself or even like the subcultural right can also produce really compelling cultural product. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, culture is fluid terrain and, yep. um, and it's, it's often, you know, it's, it's, in many ways, more full of contradictions than politics. Oh, totally. And <laughs> That's why it's so much more fun, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of, you know, like there's uh, even what we're exploring with this series, like a, a, a lot of the potency of it doesn't become clear until later, whether or not it has political significance or whether it was just an interesting expression, you know, of music that might nourish your soul, but wasn't related to popular mobilization you know, or wasn't related to, you know, like, I don't know. It's, 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 it's hard to measure the, the, the consequences of these things. And, um, and most, you know, most of the music that I listened to from this era um, is, is includes far left and far right politics because those right. were the politics of the working class, especially at the UK at that time. And that, uh, that got channeled into punk reggae and ska and you could you can see it across the board like there you know there's neo-nazi reggae music from that period totally. <laughs> yeah yep. no it's wild i mean yeah i think i mean i and then and i will say the, the last thing as i i do think there's some you want to be careful with this because the cosmopolitan thing can get so superficial but i there is one that like sort of advantage when you especially when you deal with like a very, I mean, the capitalism can deal with cosmopolitanism really easily. It's kind of a different debate, but like when you look at people who are really trying to retread some like pathetic, like, you know, white nationalist fantasy or something, there is like a part of you that's like, really, you really want to give up like all culture you've stolen from and are born into. I, I also with, you know, West still echoing in my, like, I, I think there also is just some place for the idea that, that some of this stuff is again, just like spiritual for lack of a better word and tapping humans into just like a different way of being. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to all kind of like 
be here to do in a certain way. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.